Thanks for joining us for BIV today from the newsroom of Business in Vancouver. I'm Kirk LaPointe, publisher and editor-in-chief here with journalists Haley Wooden and Tyler Orton. This podcast is part of a series of interviews with the major party leaders for the 2020 British Columbian election. For this podcast, we welcome a rather newly minted leader of the Green Party of British Columbia, Sonia Personal, MLA for Cowichan Valley. Thanks a lot for joining us today. Delighted to be here. All right. Well, let's uh, let's start out. Uh, the Premier has been arguing all the way along that an election was needed to provide political stability in the pandemic. Why do you disagree? Well, because we've shown that we've had stability for three and a half years, and in fact, some of the best governance that we've had because there have been more perspectives, more viewpoints at the table, more collaboration across party lines. And this is actually what serves British Columbians the best. Uh, it's really unfortunate that that got thrown away during a global pandemic, uh, and that instead, of being in the legislature right now, ensuring that small businesses are getting the support they need, that the tourism sector, which is you know, facing the most difficult winter uh, ever in BC, is getting the support they need. And, and we can see that the rollouts of support aren't happening uh, because of the election call. And we also hear from businesses and particularly the tourism sector that what's been put on the table isn't going to help uh, in these dire situations. So why do you think you did it? Um, well, I, I think uh, it was, I, I, I mean, that's really a question for him, but from my point of view, uh, this was a politically driven decision to try to have you know, a, a majority government. And, and I think that that was a mistake. Uh, I think that if we could actually recognize um, that governance is better when there's more voices, uh, it didn't need to happen. But that's a, that's a way of looking at politics and looking at governance uh, that's been dominant for so long in BC and Canada. And what I'm proposing and what we've shown for the last three and a half years is that uh, we can do it differently and we can do it better. Haley? You mentioned that many businesses are struggling and in fact more than a quarter of local businesses don't believe they'll be able to survive the next year. How would you and your, your party support small businesses? And so we propose immediately putting $300 million on the table to support with rent right now, just covering 25% of rent for small businesses. I just heard from um, our local uh, CFIB representative, and I've been in touch with her and with CFIB throughout the entire pandemic, uh, kind of getting weekly updates, hearing about the local experience as well as uh, you know the, the national. And it's devastating to hear this morning that a number of businesses in Cowichan have just been given their eviction notices. Uh, and, and this was why we focused on, let's help with those fixed costs, let's get those rental costs, uh, covered, you know, 25% covered for businesses. The federal program was too complicated. It required the landlord to be involved and a lot of landlords just didn't step up and didn't uh, pull their, their part in this. And then the other thing was just getting the, for the tourism operators in particular, the grant program, the criteria is too complicated. It had to be much simpler. And just getting those grants into the hands of tourism operators right now so that they can get through the winter recognizing like you have to look at the big picture here, right? Yes, it's going to cost us uh, some money to make sure that these businesses survive, but they are pivotal in terms of what they bring in employment, in economic activity, and in the long-term sustainability of businesses in different regions and different communities in BC. To what extent and, you would know, you support some of the other uh, business platform planks that the other parties have put forward, for example, cutting the PST or cutting other small business taxes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in terms of cutting the PSD, the, the, the challenge that I have with that is that we're not identifying the outcomes. So everything that we're putting on the table recognizes that we have these urgent needs to meet right now, that businesses need help right now. But it also has to recognize that we are looking at deficit spending uh, as a government, and we have to be mindful that every every investment we make, every dollar we spend, we want to be ensuring that we're identifying the outcomes we want to get from that. And a, a, an across the board cut to PSD, I, I can't identify what the specific outcomes for that will be. Being able to invest in businesses right now 
uh, ensuring that what the outcomes we want is that they survive, that they're able to keep their employees. Uh, that's that's what we're focused on. And so, so I think we have to be very mindful in a time like this that yes, government needs to spend money, government needs to invest. We are not going to get out of this through austerity, but we have to be extremely clear about how we're spending on that money, why we're spending the money, what outcomes we're trying to get, and actually measure, are we being successful in getting those outcomes? And if we're not, we need to adjust. Tyler? Well, yeah, right now we're seeing that the pandemic, it's putting a squeeze on everything from international travelers to British Columbians own desire or even just ability to go out. You brought up tourism operators, but from your perspective, what's going to be the key to ensuring both hospitality and tourism businesses survive as this pandemic continues? It's, it's, it's essential that we find ways for these sectors to survive. I mean, it, it's essential from an economic point of view, but also just from a, a community vibrancy point of view. I mean, there was an ad I saw in the Globe and Mail and it said, imagine our communities without restaurants. And I, you know, none of us want to imagine that. Think of all the times we've celebrated or enjoyed a night out or, you know, uh, the things that restaurants bring us. Uh, and I started my career, well, my many careers as a server in the restaurant industry, as do so many young people. It ha they play such pivotal roles across the spectrum of our society. And so, you know, one of the things that we put on the table is the billion dollar innovation fund, helping businesses that, that can pivot, recognizing that if, if you can be innovative and entrepreneurial right now, then government should be here to help you achieve that. And that innovation fund is also focused on transitioning of the economy so if this is a moment and crises often bring these kinds of moment of deep transformation this is a moment when we can say okay uh what a crisis we're in but if we invest in not only adapting to the moment we're in but actually preparing for the future and ensuring that that future is a more stable and resilient one uh then we're actually you know really achieving outcomes that we want to be getting right now there's no, there's no playbook or silver bullet here. But I think what we have to start from is where we want to end up. We want the vibrant communities that local businesses bring, that the, the various sectors of our economy bring. And we want a more resilient and sustainable economy. And we want to make sure that that economy is serving the health and well-being of, of the people and the communities in this province. Once we identify that that's where we want to get to, we start working backwards uh, and measuring if we're if we're succeeding in that. Let's go back to Haley. This has certainly been a moment of realizing that perhaps some inequities continue to exist in society. Many have argued that this has disproportionately affected women. How would your party support and encourage the full and equal participation of women and other groups in our economy? Yeah, you know. It, it's been interesting what economists have been saying from almost the very beginning of COVID-19, which is the most important investment right now is early childhood education. And it, it seems, you know, it's sometimes hard to kind of connect those dots. But one, it employs women. Uh, we need to make sure that it employs women who are being paid and valued for the work they do, which is why we're um, our proposal is to bring early childhood education into our public education system so there isn't this disparity between teachers who are teaching five-year-olds earning living wages, family supporting wages, and teachers who are teaching four-year-olds who are earning, you know, sometimes less than $20 an hour. Uh, and again, the research shows us how essential and important those early childhood education years are for those children and for society overall. So that's, that's essential investing in early childhood education, but then recognizing, yes, we have to ensure that the, the impacts to women uh, and particularly to women of color have been uh, outsized in this. And so that the, the investment into ensuring that there's access to training, access to education in my, you know, some, some sectors are going to take a longer time to recover. So people need to be given the opportunity to get training into sectors that are, are going to be able to thrive through this and, and be able to get into those. I, the, the investment into educating more care workers is an example of this and ensuring that they're paid livable wages and, and not having to work in different sectors. So there's lots of solutions. Um, it's again, and I've said this many times, but it is disappointing 
that we're not, we could be leaning into those solutions right now and getting those programs up and running, ensuring that people are getting the help they need, that businesses are getting the help they need. Uh, instead, we're here. And the reality is uh, we may not know the, el- the full outcome of the election until mid-November. We may not have a cabinet in place until December. This was ultimately irresponsible uh, for us to be in this position. Tyler? You know, the BC economy uh, very much built on rich resources, but in your opinion, is oil dead? It's, it's, I think we have to just speak in terms of what the transition needs to look like and how that transition from a fossil fuel economy um, and, and, you know, look at the, look at the data and the statistics, what Statistics Canada tells us is we actually have a very diverse economy in BC, health, education, service, tech, uh, tourism, uh, agriculture, fisheries, we have a, a very wide range of uh, sectors that contribute enormously to our economy. Um, the oil and gas sector has to be propped up with government uh, support and subsidies from taxpayers. And I think we should be taking a very serious look at why in the world would governments continue to uh, sustain this this sector when it can't sustain itself, when it needs this level of support. And imagine what we could be achieving if we instead had said, we're going to invest $6 billion into supporting uh, a diversified, small and medium sized manufacturing based clean energy economy in this province, we would actually be creating jobs in every region of the province that aren't boom and bust jobs, that aren't gone when a pipeline's been built uh, and that don't actually contribute to the worsening climate emergency that we're facing. We have to be realistic about where we are and where we want to get to. And governments make very significant choices when they invest money in different sectors. It's time for us to invest in the sectors that we know will lead us to a a healthier uh, world, but also a healthier, more resilient and sustainable economy. Boom and bust uh, is not good for economies. It's not good for people. Uh, And when we look at where we're at in terms of our resources, uh, if we continue at the rate we're going, for in particularly looking at the logging of old growth, the, the experts, the foresters, the scientists are telling us we're about 10 years out from that being done. And so we've got all these mills that can only, uh, only handle old growth logs and there's no logs left, right? And at the same time, we've wiped out what could be and has shown to be a significant aspect of our tourism economy. People wanna spend time in these glorious forests. They also represent biodiversity and health. So we have to be looking at a a wide variety of, of values when we're talking about our economy. And again, continuously asking, where do we wanna end up? Where do we wanna be in 10, 20 and 50 years from now? And if we, if we identify that clearly, then we start taking the steps there and get through the transition. The most important thing for us is that this isn't about winners and losers. This isn't about, oh, too bad, you got your, your start in the oil and gas industry, uh, it, you know, you, you're gonna be abandoned now. Absolutely not. There is enormous opportunity if we were transitioning to clean economy in building that clean energy sector in ensuring that people are getting the training and ensuring that the transition to those jobs is a fair and just one for the workers. Ms. Personnel, we're moving now through this phase of spending to support people and businesses in the pandemic, but at some point that has to subside. You know, we'll have to stop spending. How do you think government will need to go about paying for all of this Mm -hmm. in the years ahead? Yeah, it's it's a really important question. And, and this is why I've, I've pointed to, we have to be very clear about the outcomes that we're trying to achieve with our spending. And so across the board tax cuts or a one-time giveaway of cash uh, d- doesn't give us a, a clear sense of the outcomes. The, you know, the NDP's proposal of everybody gets a thousand dollars. Well, that's over a billion dollars. If we invested that into public education, we could be moving away from this sense of scarcity uh, that that teachers and parents and children feel in our public education system and move to a sense of abundance. Uh, that would be a good thing for our society. But you're right. You know, we have to be looking at, okay, what are 
what are the ways that we're going to be generating revenue back to government in the future? We are going to be uh, in deficit spending. We know this. It's, it's, you know, for at least a couple of years to get uh, through this very challenging time that we're in. And again, we can't, we can't wish that things were the way they were once. We have to look at the world we're in right now and identify the sectors that in five or 10 years are gonna be generating the kind of revenues. And that has to be you know, the, the, the innovation economy, the, the, the tech economy, the economy that exports not raw resources, but exports uh, ideas and technology, uh, exports the kind of capacity that we could be building here for being leaders on all sorts of fronts. Uh, and so instead of imagining uh, what we were 20 or 50 years ago, we need to imagine what we can be in, in the future and recognize that those, those sectors of the economy could be the ones that, that move us out of this place that we're, we're in right now. It's, you know, it's, it's always hard for us to let go of what has been, um, but the essential thing is that decision makers are looking at, at the reality that we're in right now and addressing that very, very clear uh, reality from an evidence-based way. Well, it's been really good talking to you today. I wanna to thank you for your uh, time and uh, generous, uh, generous amount of time that you've given us today. Thanks a lot for your help. Yeah, real pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. Talk to you soon. All right. Our series is also gonna feature interviews with BC Liberal leader, Andrew Wilkinson, and with BC NDP leader, John Horgan. And a reminder from us here at BIB, no matter your preference, no matter if you vote in person or by mail, please vote. I'm Kirk LaPointe. Thanks a lot for joining us today.